This is Euronews Tonight. Here are your top stories. The battle for Ukraine intensifies. Russia claims it has taken the southern city of Kherson, as the Ukrainian army says it's still in battle. Troops continue to mass outside of Kyiv, leaving residents to weigh up whether to stay or go. As shelling ramps up, those staying put head underground, taking shelter from the horrors above. We are scared to leave Kyiv because I saw with my own eyes a civilian bus that was shot. I saw burnt cars. I heard civilian cars with families and children were shot at. Here in the Cube, we look at verified social media videos that show unarmed Ukrainian citizens confronting Russian soldiers. And sanctions from the EU cutting Russian banks off from the SWIFT network and targeting Belarus for its role in the invasion of Ukraine. I'm Helena Humphrey. It is good to have you with us. Russia claims its forces have taken the Ukrainian city of Kherson. It would be the first major urban center to fall since the beginning of the invasion. Well, Russian defense spokesman Igor Konoshenkov says its forces are now fully in control of the port city of Kherson and negotiating with city administrators over the functioning of social infrastructure. It is situated to the south and is seen as an important strategic target for Moscow. But Ukrainian officials dispute Russia claim they say the army is still in control and still fighting. Meanwhile, Kharkiv and Kyiv are managing to hold off their attackers despite heavy shelling and Kharkiv's regional governor says at least 21 people have been killed and 112 wounded over the last 24 hours. In Kyiv, bridges leading towards the capital have been destroyed by the Ukrainian army to try to slow down the invading army. Well, as Russian troops push on towards Kyiv, worried residents are seeking safety underground. Some train services have been suspended, while metro stations shelter families from shelling and gunfire. Hospitals in the capital are also moving patients into basements while bombs continue to fall. And those taking shelter say the horrors they've witnessed above are keeping them below. We are scared to leave Kyiv because I saw with my own eyes a civilian bus that was shot. I saw burnt cars. I heard civilian cars with families and children were shot at. And we can cross over now to our correspondent in Brussels, Shona Murray. Shona, good to see you. Uh, Brussels uh, and the EU talking sanctions today on Russia and on Belarus. Walk us through them. Well, these uh, sanctions were the ones announced at the weekend, but we got further details of them today, in particular the seven Russian banks that have been sanctioned under the SWIFT financial messaging system. Uh, VTB Bank, with the second largest bank in Russia, has been blacklisted, but others, Gazprom Bank, for example, and Spare Bank, have not been listed. The EU says this is because many member states use those banks to pay for uh, gas. Um, the other point is that the EU's position is that they want to allow you know, some sort of functioning banking system in Russia to ensure that the average person can engage in some level of commerce. There was already also sanctions in relation to Belarus, uh, where 22 military personnel, uh, as well as various sectors of the Belarusian uh, economy, have been targeted, in particular uh, timber and various other things like tobacco, dual-use goods, so goods that can be used in conflict as well. This is around the fifth, at least the fifth uh, round of sanctions for Belarus. So these are sanctions that have uh, been uh, announced over the weekend. But I think uh, from the EU's perspective, it, it, it marks a big shift, a big change when it comes to sanctions for Brussels so far. All right. So that is the response then from the European Union, fr from Brussels. Um, in the UK, Prime Minister Boris Johnson, though, coming under quite some fire, uh, in fact, in Parliament today, under pressure for the UK's response. So I want to take a listen to what the leader of the opposition, Sir Keir Starmer, had to say and then ask you about it. Uh, last week, Putin summoned to the Kremlin the cronies who prop up his regime. They dipped their hands in the blood of Putin's war. Among them was Igor Shuvalov, Putin's former deputy prime minister. Shuvalov owns two flats, not five minutes' walk from this house. They're worth over 11 million pounds. He is on the EU sanctions list, but he's not on the UK sanctions list. And thanks to the powers that uh, this House and this Government has taken, uh, we can sanction any individual, any company uh, connected, connected with the Putin regime. 
Well, Shona, essentially this comes down to who the UK is not sanctioning. Well, that's clearly the position of the likes of Keir Starmer, the Labour, leader of the Labour Party and others, particularly when you see what the EU is doing and what the UK is not doing. And I'm joined on this by sanctions expert and campaigner, um, Bill Browder. Uh, Bill, tell us what your reaction is to what's not on the list of sanctions for the UK so far. Well, and not, not on the list of sanctions for the UK are, are some of the biggest oligarchs in the country, which... Um, you know, we, we all know there, there's famous Russian oligarchs. We all know who they are. Um, some of them have been sanctioned by the uh, United States. Some of them have been sanctioned by the EU, um, and they're not sanctioned by the UK. And so it's, um, uh, you know, until and it, there's a lot of tough talk. There's a lot of, um, you know, uh, rhetoric, which sounds great. But when you get into the details, there's still need. There's a lot of work that, that Britain needs to do uh, to live up to the tough talk. What about Robin Abramovich? That's, that's the name that keeps emerging. Well, um, uh, you know, in, it's 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 kind of strange um, that you know he was involved in in a major lawsuit uh, against an author who um, uh, Catherine Belton, who wrote a book mm -hmm. about Putin mm -hmm. and all of his corruption and how the oligarchs were assisting uh, Putin. Uh, clearly, didn't want to have that label against him. Uh, Abramovich has has uh, been been trying to transfer assets to to other people. Chelsea apparently is supposed to be transferred to to some tr charity or, or 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 some strange thing. Um, I mean, it's it's um, you know it, kind of logical that you'd go after the biggest. If you're going to sanction oligarchs, you should go after the biggest oligarch. What 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 what's why is he exempt? That is, I guess, my question. Well, that is the question I was going to ask you. I mean, is there a feeling that uh, these Russian garks, I mean, this is certainly that what many ME MPs in the UK journalists are saying is that a lot of this money rolls into the Tory party. Well, I, I, um, as far as I'm aware, Abramovich hasn't given any money to the Tory party. Um, some uh, uh, totally unknown Russians have. Um, I, I don't think that that's the reason why he's not on the sanctions list. I would imagine, just from from reading the tea leaves and and looking at a few articles, that the Foreign Office is petrified of the army of lawyers that will come after them the moment that he or or others are put on the sanctions list, and so they're they're tiptoeing around. But you know, it's it's we're in a, we're in a moment of national security. I don't think being fear, afraid of lawyers is um, is a good excuse when, when bullets are flying and missiles are being launched and so on. So what do you think of the EU's uh, shift in policy? Because this time last week, we weren't even talking about SWIFT. Now you've seen suspension of the licenses for Sputnik, for RT. Um, really, the EU has moved almost past the Rubicon at this stage when it came to sanctions. Well, so the EU is, I mean, it's a total 180 degree turn. The EU is the first um, uh, national bloc to, to talk about sanctioning Putin himself and Sergei Lavrov. Uh, the EU has uh, um, stopped Russian jets and private jets from entering the airspace uh, involved in SWIFT and, and freezing the central bank's assets. But, but on, on the SWIFT, um, as, as we kind of discover the details, we discover that, you know, that there, uh, there's a lot of ways in which um, the banking system still works. And if we want to, um, you know, if the objective is to really pound Russia um, hard, economically, then we should have pounded them hard. And, and the fact that there's all these loopholes on the SWIFT um, just shows you, you know, the way that Europe works, which is, you know, great announcements, and then, but then really kind of ugly, you know, smoky backroom deals that we don't even know how they came about. So um, how do you feel these sanctions are going to work in terms of, I suppose, uh, popular opinion in Russia and the impact on what Putin's going to do? Well, I, I, you know, Putin. We, we could have we could have altered Putin's calculus before he launched the invasion. So Putin is a guy who, when he gets involved in a conflict, he can never back down. He doesn't have a reverse gear. He's um, absolutely unwilling to show that he made a mistake, admit a mistake. He, he has to always be the tough guy. And so now that he's escalated, all he can do is continue to escalate. And so at this point, the sanctions are not about. Um, negotiating with him and anyone who who's putting them in place in that with that thought are, are going to be is going to be disappointed. The sanctions at this point are to deplete him of the resources to execute a war. If we freeze the central bank assets, if we were to do a proper swift unplugging of the whole banking system, and if we were to do a proper freezing of the oligarchs' assets, 
then there wouldn't be any money left for him to execute his war after some period of time. And so that, in my mind, is what's going to stop him. It's not going to be his, he's not going to stop on his own volition. He's going to stop because gravity will, um, you know, get in the way. And the gravity is lack of money. Okay, Bill Bryder, author of Red Notice, Magdizzi Act Campaign. Thank you very much for joining us. Back to you in studio, Helena. Shana Mari, thank you so much. Well, life for most Ukrainians has changed completely. In just seven days, air raid sirens, missile attacks, they've become the new normal. So to hear more about what life inside Kiev is like, we're joined now by Lesia Vasilenko, a Ukrainian MP from the Kholos political party. Thank you so much for, for being with us, for taking the time in extremely difficult circumstances. So firstly, how are you doing? What is the situation where you are right now? Uh, well, right now I'm on the road, uh, moving from point A to point B. And the situation here is exactly like everywhere for all Ukrainians today. Taking it slow. Our, and, um, basically fighting our way through this uh, atrocious terrorist war that Russia and Putin particularly are waging against Ukraine. Um, I saw that you wrote on Twitter today that for the second time in three months you had to hand over your nine-month-old baby daughter with your two other children. Um, I was very sorry to read that. How are they doing? How do you talk to them about what is happening? Just as we speak, I received a text message saying and uh, they, they got to, to the place where they're supposed to be. But uh, it is true that the most difficult uh, point in uh, these seven days was yesterday when I realized that I don't know the exact date when I will be seeing them. Although I told them that it's going to be sort of like uh, when they go off on holiday without me or uh, to, uh, when uh, mommy goes on a business trip. But uh, the, the big difference with that is that holidays and business trips they have a definite date uh, when you come back and when you're re reunited. Uh, this particular case doesn't have an end date. The is when all of this will end is Vladimir Putin, who uh, is the one calling the shots literally on uh, all of Ukraine. And I, I can see that you're on the road at the moment, that you're moving right now. Do you intend to stay in the Ukrainian capital? I also saw a picture of you online with a rifle. Would you fight? I would if uh, my life was put in danger. And right now, with all the uh, Russian soldiers roaming the road of Ukrainian villages and towns being lost, not able to find their way back to their military battalions, what we see uh, is a lot of trespassing. And uh, since they have the task to, to kill Ukrainians, this is what they do in towns, in villages, uh, all across the country. So to have a gun in your home is uh, an essential, essential need at this point in time. The same as having water, the same as having bread to eat. So uh, this is why a lot of Ukrainians, uh, if not all, are armed at, uh, in, in this very difficult time. Um, increasingly, we've seen Russian airstrikes uh, hitting areas where there are children, children being killed. What is your message right now to the international community about what you need? Russia has broken every rule in the book, in the book of international law and international humanitarian law. In Kharkiv, uh, just a few days ago, they used weapons forbidden by the Geneva Conventions. They used vacuum bombs which suck the air out of uh, people's lungs and cassette bombs, which are say, hundreds of other little bombs. Both of these weapons are uh, designed to cause extreme suffering to human beings. Russia should be not just condemned, but Russia should pay for every single crime that they have committed, for every single life that they have taken, every single child's life that they have taken. Today, we have uh, the preliminary number of civilian casualties at 2,000. But this is not the end of the count because still many people are trapped under the rubble of the buildings which are shattered by Russian missiles and Russian bombs. What we need from the inter international community is to step up immediately. We need a no-fly zone over Ukraine so that our children can sleep safely at night, so that 
we wake up in the morning and we see the sunlight and not the rubble which we have to clear away and the dead bodies of women and children lying in the streets. We need a green corridor, an airlift, of humanitarian aid to the cities of Kyiv and Kharkiv and the other densely populated cities of Ukraine. What is happening now is the extermination of a whole country right in the middle of Europe, of a people 44 million strong. And this is done by one man and one man only, Vladimir Putin, and he must be stopped. Sanctions are good and we are very grateful for those, but physically here on the ground, we need the Allied powers to fight with us on, in the air, on the seas and on the ground, shoulder to shoulder with Ukrainian soldiers. It's only like this that we can counter the largest army in Europe and the biggest aggressor and terrorist in the world. All right. Lesia Vasilenko, a Ukrainian MP in Kyiv. Thank you so much for speaking to us in the most difficult of circumstances. Thank you. Ukraine's defense ministry says that Russian ally Belarus is preparing to send troops into Ukraine via its northern border, a move denied by Alexander Lukashenko. In support of Ukraine, the Belarusian opposition leader has launched an anti-war movement in her country. And joining me now from Vilnius is Svetlana Tikhonovskaya. Svetlana Tikhonovskaya, thank you so much for joining us on Euronews. Now, as the world watches President Putin invade Ukraine, do you fear that he plans to do the same in Belarus? You know, uh, for sure, uh, Putin looks at uh, Belarus as uh, the part of Russia, but we are a separate uh, country, independent country, and we uh, don't want to lose this independence, of course. And now uh, Putin has Lukashenko as his ally, as his accomplice. And, but it, it seems to us that Lukashenko is not controlling the situation anymore. So we also under the threat of uh, you know, some kind of uh, Russian occupation. But people in Belarus uh, cherish their independence and will fight for it. Yeah, so what about the people there in Belarus? I mean, what do they want when it does appear that Lukashenko is standing shoulder to shoulder with Putin? You say that uh, they don't want this, that there could be resistance. What would that look like? Uh, so, you know, our task, uh, first of all, now is to um, avoid uh, Belarusian troops enter Ukraine, because uh, all the Belarusians don't want this war. Uh, we have to divide regime uh, of Lukashenko and Belarusian people, and uh, now we are trying to help uh, Ukraine in different ways. So uh, we work with information, informational front. We spread the truth uh, in Belarus and fight propaganda, you know, to interfere with information war waged by dictators. Also, we mobilize mothers to prevent their sons, brothers and husbands from being sent to fight against the Ukrainians. They have to put pressure on the authorities and military registration and and officers to demand information about the location of their men to stop sending uh, them to the front. Also, we do everything to weaken the regime and prevent uh, the regime from waging war. We show disobedience, we prepare strike, we disable equipment and slow down its work. Yes, so we... let me pick you up on that, if, if I may, because you've talk, spoken about uh, essentially an info war about uh, spreading information to inform people. But if the worst comes to the worst, and I know that you've launched um, an anti-war movement, would you be talking potentially about an, an, an armed resistance? So when we are talking about anti-war, it means that uh, this uh, anti-Ukrainian war. And uh, we have to explain people uh, that we uh, don't, will not allow this war happen in Belarus. But we have such a situation when Lukashenko accomplice to Russia and uh, and now, uh, you know, nobody knows what could happen. And Belarusian people are, uh, I hope, ready to defend uh, our soil, our land uh, uh, from, from uh, Kremlin. Let me ask you about the West then, because the West's attention is very much fixed on Ukraine at the moment and Russia. And we've seen those sanctions uh, from the European Union on Russia, also on Belarus. But I want to ask you, um, do they go far enough? And is the West's attention fixed enough on this situation that's occurring now in Belarus? 
of course, uh, uh, world attention is uh, focused on Ukraine, Ukraine now, and it's understandable, but uh, we, it's important not to forget about Belarus as well. And uh, Lukashenko shares all the responsibilities for uh, this war, uh, and he has to feel the consequences. So I'm asking our international partners to impose as much sanctions uh, as possible on Lukashenko as well, to uh, deprive him of resources to... Uh, split a leads. It's uh, very important to, um, uh, you know, to, to, to be focused on Belarus as well. All right, Svetlana Tikhanovskaya, leader of the Belarusian pro-democratic opposition in exile. Good to talk to you. Thank you. This is Euronews tonight. Thanks for your company. Well, amid the war in Ukraine, a number of videos have appeared on social media showing ordinary Ukrainian citizens confronting Russian forces. And Matthew in the cube has been taking a look. Helena, claims and videos from both Russia and Ukraine are still difficult to prove. But here in the Kyiv, we have seen a number of verified social media videos that appear to show Ukrainian citizens who are unarmed, resisting and confronting Russian soldiers. This is one example in the southern city of Melitopol. Here you can see people laying on the ground in an effort to block the path through the city, while others use their bare hands to stop the progress of a Russian military vehicle. Let me show you another clip from the nearby resort town of Berdyansk. Here again you can see Russian forces being approached by ordinary unarmed Ukrainian citizens who are waving the Ukrainian national flag and chanting the Ukrainian national anthem. Verified videos like these are appearing across Ukraine, some even showing citizens joking with the Russian tanks, offering to tow them back across the border when they had run out of fuel. Others showing tractors dragging Russian military vehicles through the countryside, while elderly citizens curse and swear at Russian soldiers stood just metres of the way. At the very start of this video in Berdyansk, you can actually hear the cameraman say to the Russian soldiers, go ahead, shoot me, I am unarmed, before he asks them, why did you come here? Leave while you are still alive. Now, Russia's defence ministry has been very vocal about the strength and preparedness of its forces. But videos like that appear to show that Russia is facing unexpected fierce resistance on the ground, especially in those Ukrainian cities they have already captured. Here in the Cube, we've told you how state media has been portraying the Kremlin narrative that Russia is yielding a special military operation to denazify Ukraine, a failed state that supposedly poses an existential threat to Russia. These claims are unverified, but still, state media in Russia are reporting that the forces are being welcomed in the country, rather like the Soviet ones were during the liberation of the region from the Nazis in the Second World War. But as you can see from those social media videos, that is not the case. Instead, Russian soldiers are being confronted by unarmed Ukrainian citizens who are telling them that they have invaded a country where the government is democratically elected, and also, Helena, of course, where the Ukrainian president himself is Jewish. Well, some extraordinary scenes of bravery there from ordinary Ukrainians. Matthew, thank you so much for sharing that with us. And that's the latest from us. We'll see you very soon. Bye for now.